Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, obviously, starting 2024 on the right start. Uh, second episode of the new year on the show. I'm Nithin Ramachandra from the NR Media, NR Hour, back with another uh, another episode. And fans, you, everybody knows about our speak rap on our phone, so please tune on there and uh, put in your questions in that in the speak rap. We'll answer your questions. Um, but before we before I introduce our today's guest, we are live on iHeartRadio, Spotify, on all the podcast platforms. So please, everyone else, please tune in on those apps. Uh, today we have a really special guest. His name is Corey Hart. He's a former. Uh, MLB outfielder, right fielder. What a great career. He played with the Milwaukee Brewers, Seattle Banners, Pittsburgh Pirates, two-time All-Star, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Brewers Wall of Honor. Uh, man, what a great career. And uh, he, he he was – he. this is a type of player you want on the team. He brought intensity uh, to every game. And, uh, man, what a, what a great career. Fun to watch. Uh, he, he made every play in the outfield and great hitter uh, and part of great teams in his career. So we'll get to all of his – uh, journey career how he got started and obviously uh we're going to talk about his family and everything so fans please tune please tune in and uh, we'll answer your questions on the speak rap but Corey, i just want to say thank you for joining us today on the show happy new year to you and your family and uh how are you and your family doing today no thanks for having me on man uh no me and the family are good we're uh we're busy in the after the life after baseball <laughs> we got a farm we got a farm so uh yeah, that that keeps definitely keeps us going. My wife, and my daughter like to buy animals left and right, so <laughs> I got a lot. I got a lot of cleaning up to do out here all the time. Hey, speaking of family, uh, I want to start off with that. And uh, you guys are big, like you said, a farm, and your daughter is big into horses. And um, you told me recently that she's competing like in a horse, the horse racing. And talk talk about that. And uh, what's that been like for you as a father, uh, helping your daughter out in that in that uh, particular thing. Uh, I mean, of course, I I love it. I but I don't I don't help her at all. She knows a thousand times more than I do. So I'm uh I'm, so I'm very good at uh, picking up manure and carrying things around and making sure she has what she needs. But but it's been fun. I mean, after baseball, I, I think any athlete you you kind of try to find something to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of that life after. Like I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what's next. And you know, I love coaching. I coach my older boy. He's 19 now. I coached him as soon as I stopped playing. I coached him all all the way through club ball in high school but getting the horse stuff like again I don't know anything so yeah. I'm just I'm learning as I go but you know she's it's a very dedicated girl and she travels around a lot so it gives me you know that keeps us going because you know like we were when I was talking to you last week we were in Tucson but you know she goes to Reno and Texas and Utah and Colorado so we have to learn how to uh I said I'm learning how to fly how to, to be a travel a uh, horse uh, a horse hand I guess if you will so uh, what, what's the what's the scattering for on your son as a baseball player? My so he's you know right now he's a he's a two way guy. So mm -hmm. he's a freshman at Yavapai College. It's like up in Prescott. Uh, of course he's hurt, so he'll he'll probably have to redshirt this year. I would mm -hmm. imagine because he's he got hurt close to Halloween, and it's a non throwing arm, which is great. So he doesn't. It's just a bad strain, but uh, he's kind of that. Uh, he'll be a pitcher. Like he's that guy that. He has terrible vision, so outfield, you know, he's an outfielder, but he's, it's always challenging to see the ball, especially some of these twilights and these nights out here. So I think he'll be a guy that's on the mound. I mean, he's always been that – been able to get guys out. He's kind of funky. He's not like a hundred pence arm. Mm -hmm. You know, the arm angle, he's kind of awkward. So, you know, even when he wasn't throwing hard, he was always effective. And now, of course, he's getting older and stronger. He's starting to throw harder. And, and now he's in that 88, 90 range and – of course, just trying to get him healthy so he can get back out there and compete. But he'll be at a he, – he, you know, he trains the drive line, which is pretty uh popular spot. So yeah. as soon as he's – as soon as he can get back out there, he'll, he'll be back out there and, you know, hopefully they get him in the, the mid-90 range so he can uh, wear a uniform one of these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so tell our fans – um you, you grew up – you were born in Bo uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. And uh, tell our fans, how did you get uh, into baseball and – um, who did you look up to uh, watching the game of baseball? Like I got drafted, of course, you know, 11th round down to, mm -hmm. I was in Kentucky. So, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I grew up with my dad. My dad was, uh, like, a professional softball player back mm -hmm. in the day. So, he got, you know, so I was always, as long as I can remember, I was always at ballpark. So, you know, I was always playing catch with him and the guys and traveling around with him and, you know, that kind of, that life. So, I didn't really know any different. You know, as a kid, I grew up, I didn't know really, you know, pay attention to the difference between softball and baseball. I would just like to be at a ballpark. And, you know, so he kind of 
pushed me that that way just because I was watching him and then learn how to play that way. And I just kind of evolved. And, you know, as I got older, I just, my dad was, you know, besides pro softball, which back then didn't really pay anything. You just got paid to go to tournaments, things like that. So it wasn't very lucrative. And then he was a construction guy. So, if, you know, in my mind, I was just, you know, I wanted to, something different, you know, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I saw the struggles him and my mom had. So I was trying to, I said better myself and see what I could accomplish. But so that, that drive and that, that work ethic was always there just because I, you know, I saw how hard it was if things didn't go my way. Wow. So I try to make sure they did <laughs> if I could. Yeah. So talk about, uh, we are live with former MLB outfielder, Corey Hart. Uh, fans, please put your questions in questions into the speed graph. Uh, I'll, I'll answer uh, some of your questions for Corey here, but uh, tell our fans about, uh, did you get to play when you were uh, growing up and then uh, working on your baseball career? Did you get to play any other positions before uh, settling out on uh, outfielder? When I got so when I got drafted, I was a shortstop. Yeah. So I mean, Kentucky, obviously, it's not necessarily known for being a great baseball state. So I think you know most schools out that way. If you're the you know if you're one of the best athletes, you go to shortstop. So I'm sure I made you know 20 errors a year at shortstop, but I had a good <laughs> had a good arm. So. Uh, I was the shortstop, so when I got drafted, I went straight to. It was basically like, "Hey, you're you're good at high school. Go to the outfield." Yeah. So I went to the outfield like the first day, and then I was there for maybe five days, and then our first baseman broke his hand. And back then, we only had one first baseman on the team, so in like in the minor leagues, we were so basically they had the coaches asked like who could play first. So I, you know, I was like, I'm looking around. I was like, we had a first rounder, a fifth rounder, and. Vladimir Guerrero's cousin was on our team. We had another Latin like superstar. So I'm like, dude, I'm like the fifth guy at best. Mm. So I was like, hey, I'll go play first just to get myself in the lineup. And then actually, then I started playing. Basically, then I, that kind of stuck. I played first for two and a half years. And then uh, they signed Prince. Mm -hmm. Then turned into like, hey, where else, you, where else can you play? <laughs> so uh, then that's the same thing. I tried third for a little bit and then I went, to, ended up settling the outfield. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and, uh, we we actually we do have a fan question here just on my phone just popped in. One of our fans wants to know, did you ever think of being like a Shohei Otani type of player? <laughs> did I? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Well, you know what's so funny because when I got drafted, I was I did pretty good. I hit like you know I think my first year I hit like two eighty. Mm -hmm. Now I hit two home runs, and then my uh, second year I repeated rookie ball, and I got off to like literally I was like three for forty. I'm like, I'm going to get released anytime I can. So I, I would start sneaking out and trying to throw bullpens. Mm. So I'm like, if, if, if hitting's not going to work out, I, I got to find a way not to go home. So I, I would throw bullpens and, you know, I, I think I would have been okay. But I, I, my 88 to 91, when I was 19, it was a far cry from a Otani style. So I don't think it would have lasted very long. <laughs> yeah, talk about, uh, talk about your high school career. And you went to Greenwood High School. Uh, Gators and Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, talk about that experience and uh, what, what was that like for you? That was great, man. Like so, we Kentucky is not a huge baseball state, so if you're a good team, you you kind of stand out. So, I was fortunate that I had great coaches. Like, I, of course, I my you know now baseball travel baseball. You have, I mean, there's thousands of teams out there. But when I grew up, we basically had one team. So we had one team for uh, maybe 16 high schools. You know, so like I was fortunate to play club ball with you know a handful of my friends on my my high school but I said we had good high schools man like we traveled to Florida quite a bit we were in Georgia Tennessee so we, I was able to like hit some of the the better I guess more known states for baseball and you know because I got good kind of early on like so teams would you know they'd want to play us because you know like a lot of these teams out there there's not a ton of great competition so they look for you know like a guy like myself or I, I played with Joe, uh, Joe Blanton growing up. Yeah. So, you know, they, they want to see Joe. So we would be able to see some of these, these really good teams. So it made for, even though, even though Kentucky's not, I think they've actually gotten better since I was there, but uh, we were able, always able to see really good competition because people wanted to see us. So I was fortunate. So like when I grew up, so it was me, Joe Blanton played, you know, 10, 11 years in the big leagues. And there's an, another guy named Matt Wilhite. He, uh, he never made it to the big leagues, but he was like some belt pitcher of the year at uh, Western Kentucky, which is where I was going to go, that, which is in Bowling Green. You know, he played five or six years in AAA. So, I mean, we had a, a handful of guys that were really good that kind of people wanted to pay attention to. 
So it made it for fun because, you know, we didn't get to play those teams that we killed. We we had that chance to play in some of these better competitions, some of these better tournaments that, you know, a lot of schools out there don't get a chance to. Yeah, speaking of Joe Blanton, I remember Joe Blanton in the major league. He was an underrated pitcher, in my opinion, and uh, is he, he seems forgotten now. But uh, talk about what was he like uh, growing up together and when did you realize that he can be something special in the majors? Oh, from the start, dude. When It was so funny because, you know, we played – obviously said club we grew up together and played club and all that stuff but we would we would a funny story we were in like i think birmingham alabama like in you know december or january it's probably 30 degrees and raining outside so i think we were trying to sneak in some alcohol at some point and joe was always a big dude so we would, so we would go to the gas station and try to like use him as like the big guy and like try to like you know intimidate some of these these smaller 21 year olds which is funny because you know i think at 15 joe or 15, 16, Joe was probably, you know, 6'4", 250 already. He was a big dude. He was, you know, heavy set. He wasn't like this muscular dude, but he was our, he was our, our, our mini bouncer, if you will. <laughs> but, but, I mean, like, so Joe, like in high school, Joe was 95, 98 in high school. Wow. So he was always, like, he, we grew up and he was like the power guy. Like, he was always just the best pitcher in the state. Like, it doesn't matter where we went. He was just the guy. So he didn't get, he actually didn't get drafted to high school. Mm-hmm. which I, i'm sure there was you know money talks or he, he went to kentucky so maybe he really wanted to go to kentucky so but he evolved into you know really good pitcher like after high school like he was always that really hard thrower and then he went to kentucky and he's still a first rounder but you know he became that that low 90s with a really good change up and curveball guy which you know he lasted a long time so he had a great career so we were talking to former mlb outfielder Corey hart we have another fan question for you uh, one of our fans wants to know uh, some of your best moments in your career? I think, I think it was always team stuff. I mean, I love, like, you know, the, hitting the three home runs by my sleep. That, that game was really cool just because I'd never done it before. But, you know, like important situations like walk-off hits, like a couple walk-off homers. But, you know, I was a part of Trevor Hoffman's 600 save, you know, which was, you know, watch the guys carry him off the field was pretty ridiculously, <laughs> to make, you know, amazing. And yeah. just, you know, making the playoffs. Like the first year and we made the playoffs in 08, you know, the Mets – we had to wait for the Mets and Florida Marlins game. I think they were playing. So we had to wait for that game. So, you know, after we clinched, I guess we clinched. We, if, if they would have lost, we would have had to play a tie, you know, tiebreaker game. But, you know, we, at the moment we thought we had clinched. So we had to wait for that game. So all the guys were on the field watching the big screen because the, the Brewers put the, that game on the Jumbotron. So we were able to see that. And that was just kind of a cool moment to be on the field with your family and friends and your teammates and kind of see that kind of unfold. But, just things like that. I mean, the home run derby, you know, being able to watch Josh Hamilton go crazy in uh, in New York. And then, you know, just being a part of some of that stuff, just it's kind of hard. It's one of those things that there's a lot of good memories out there playing team sports because so many things happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to go back to your high school career. And uh, during your the high school career, you played everywhere on the diamond and also relief pitch, too. Uh, so there's <laughs> o- Otani in there a little bit, but uh, t- talk about that, getting the experience of playing all positions and also relief pitching. Talk about all that. It's so funny because I was like, I grew up, I was always a pretty good hitter. So I, you know, said I, I grew up as a shortstop, but when, once, as I got older, like when scouts would start coming around, like I would have, you know, full workouts in the outfield or, hey, we want to see you play third today or, hey, we want to see you play first today. So I'd be playing in center field. So I was kind of jumping around which was fun, you know, but at the same time, I think I had more fun when I pitched because I didn't pitch a lot. Yeah. So we had a back, our backup shortstop when I was in high school was not, you know, he was a young, inexperienced kid. So I feel like every, and I was, even though I threw pretty hard in high school, I wasn't like a big strikeout guy. So there was a lot of contact. So like a lot of ground balls at shortstop that weren't made. And so I loved pitching, but at the same time, I didn't want to pitch because I wasn't like, I didn't know how to pitch. I just had a pretty good arm. So, you know, I was like, if I didn't strike you out, I'm like, I'm going to give up a ground ball and it's going to be an error. So I was like, oh. so I was, I think I concentrated more on just being a hitter. And when I had, when I pitched, just have fun with it. Oh. Yeah. So, so tell our fans about your draft experience. You got drafted uh, by the Brewers and you spent a long time with the Brewers, but uh, talk about that draft moment with you, with you and your family and uh, getting the call. And what was that like for you uh, being drafted by the Brewers? What was, I mean, I don't know, like, so I wasn't, like, a, a very high prospect. So, you know, I wasn't on TV. It wasn't, like, I didn't have a, a big squad around me because I wasn't really expecting it. I knew there was a chance, but I didn't realize what was going to happen. So, like, after, when I got drafted, I got drafted on the second day. 
but I think I would, I, I just got back from like baseball practice you know, because we were already starting to get ready for club that year. So I'm like coming back from practice. I think I was asleep on the couch and my dad's like, Hey, your name's on your name just popped up on the computer. So I was like, Oh, <laughs> so it was, it was quick though, man. Cause I literally, I got drafted like on the, the second or fourth. And then I was on a flight two days later to Utah. Oh. Hmm. There was no, uh, there's no like preparation. It was more like a, you know, fast pace. Like you got there, go figure it out, and so which actually helped me. I mean, once I got there, it was it was such a blur that I just was out there to try to figure out what was next. Um, we we have another fan question for you. One of our fans wants to know who is the funniest teammate that you play with. Funny, oh, Tim Dillard. Like, hands down. I mean, so yeah, I played with two guys. So I would say Dave Pember. Shout out to Dave, which is I only play with him for a minute, but super funny dude. But Tim, Tim is like he's very unique. You know what I mean? Like he could he could be a Saturday Saturday Night Live guy tomorrow. <laughs> like and he would he wouldn't stay he, he wouldn't like and he would fit in. Like he has that ability to he you know he's very good at memorization, but he's also like good at characters and he has really good at voices. So and he's that dude. He can make the funny thing with him. So sometimes in spring training you have these. You always have team meetings before you go out and do stuff, but you know the coaches aren't. You know if their, if their meetings run long, like you're just stuck in the clubhouse for however long. So he would literally like if they were ever late, like he would go and he would do a team meeting by himself, and he would do every coach, and even like it sounded it was so funny. Half the time they'd walk in and just and they wouldn't even do it. I mean they would just sit there and watch him. So was, wow. so he was just that he was so good. But you need guys like that. I mean, key baseball is such a long, strenuous like stressful situation all the time and you know you need players like that to kind of take you to take you away from it once in a while yeah like when we had tim on the show and um he uh, he told us about his impressions he did impressions of tim kirchin uh throughout his dude. career <laughs> <laughs> yeah did. dude tim's so, tim's so funny but he said he's so, he said he's a unique kid man i love he was fun to be around yeah but uh talk about so Obviously, you spend a long time with the Brewers, but I want Brewers, but I want to talk about the 08 team when they went out in the tread down line to get TC Sabathia to to come. They were committed. To, they wanted they wanted to win that year and talk about that 08 team and uh, it seemed special for you guys. You went to the playoffs, but fortunately came out short. But still, when they when they made that trade, the big trade of CC and made multiple moves. How, how special that I feel that they were committed to committed to win in that in that for the franchise. No, so it's like so the year before in 07, we were, you know, same thing. We were really good. We were still young, but we were really good. And we had that like kind of momentum. And then that, we didn't really make a trade at the deadline. You know, there was no like big acquisition that kind of put us over the top. So when we got to 08, same thing. We got out to a really good start and we were winning a lot of games. So I think, you know, we were kind of as players, like as a group, we're trying to feel like, man, we're, you know, we're one pretty good piece away from making this happen. And of course, I think obviously the, the team saw that saw that when Doug Melvin and Gordash went out and got a CC man, that made us it just gives you energy. Like you know, we are a pretty good team, but when you have a guy like him that you know is gonna anchor you, yeah, it made such a big difference. And he was, of course, such a good dude, such a good teammate. But just to have him out there, and of course, I would say every fifth day, but dude, he was pitching every third day half the time. That he's like his uh his role with us was pretty special. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I live near the New York, New Jersey area. I I've seen it firsthand when CC signed with the Yankees. Uh, and from the beginning, when he start uh started his Yankee career, you can tell that he was a a great guy, great person. And um, every fifth day on the mound, you feel like you're gonna win behind him. And uh, and CC is just that 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 dog, the horse, like where he wants to go all nine innings, uh, do a complete game. And and I did, uh, before I go back there, I want to uh ask you the three the three long. To me, the three long tenured brewers, in my opinion, is you, uh, Greg Council, and Tim Dillard. Uh, when it comes when it comes to Greg Council, obviously play with him, and then uh, and then he managed right. like, before going to the Cubs, and then you spending a long time with, from 04 to uh, to 12, 2012, and then Tim Dillard uh, getting um, mo spending most of the time as a player there also, and and now calling the games. I mean, broadcasting for them with the Brewers. So what what, what do you say that that that's the uh, like you're the th the you three are the longest tenured ten tenured uh, brewers. I think we're close. I mean, obviously, it's hard to not it's hard to leave out Braun because yeah, Braun Braun only wore a jer only wore a brewer jersey, but yeah, I mean, I think like it's some it's special when you're part of a group that uh 
you know, cause there's so many teams that you could go to and there's so many reasons to, you know, to stay with a group or to leave a group. And, you know, but to me, Milwaukee was very family uh, oriented. You know what I mean? Like say they were always super helpful with, you know, I had kids early. So if you had kids, man, they were so valuable and they took care of you so well. So I was, you know, when we eventually left, it wasn't an easy, easy situation, but you know, my career was winding down. I couldn't stay healthy. So I actually thought it was, I would do them a disservice to try to stay in because I knew I couldn't play every day. So, mm-hmm. but they were, you know, they were like same thing with Tim. Tim had kids and very like they're very faith based. The, the that situation is so like the coaching staff with anyway Marcus Handel and yeah. like he did such a good job of you know reining guys in and and making the the community involved. You know, making the guys get out in the community and do things. It was just it was fun and I think that was a reason for guys to stay. I know guys leave for different reasons, but like you know Tim came back for that reason because it was a special group and of course council same way not of course obviously coach there but you know just valuable you have good utility type players that you know they, if they want to be around a, a group it's you try to you try to keep them there because they're important i can't believe i forgot about ryan braun you can never forget about ryan <laughs> he's a legend in milwaukee i can't believe i forgot about him but uh we have a we have a fan question for you another one uh one of our fans wants to know uh, what what was your pregame routine before uh like a big game? What what was your routine before a game? They want to know. Uh, well, basically, I mean, baseball, like I think in, more than any sport, is super or you know superstitious. So, you know, I kind of did the same thing all the time. I'd always, you know, stretch and work out, and then I would get in the hot tub, like cold tub, kind of like go back and forth. You know, Milwaukee had a, a swim X, so I could get in the pool and swim a little bit just to try to stay loose. I mean, as you get older, you realize, as I got older, you realize you know the importance of making sure your body doesn't break down because it's it, it happens very easy. And baseball is one of those sports that, you know, you stand around, then you got to move really fast. So, like, there's not that consistent movement. So it's pretty easy to to pull things and to strain something. So I was always kind of in that aspect where I, you know, I made sure that I was stretched out. And we had great trainers there. So, you know, if anything was wrong, they were always making sure I was doing my thing. They wouldn't let me kind of skip it. So they make sure that I stayed – focus on my pregame type stuff and same thing with food you know if I could eat Subway every day if I was doing good you know then if I didn't I would you know mix it up but you know try to eat the same foods every day the same shakes the same type of course you know wear the same shirt wear the same socks different things like that just to try to keep good things going in a positive way yeah so you were part one of the one of the players uh one of the four players for the Brewers and for you, uh, for you, how special was it for you to, to play with players like Ryan Braun, Prince Fielder, uh, and you had a lot of great players, J.J. Hardy, you played with CC. but what was it like to just to be part of one of the core players of Milwaukee? It was cool, man. Like, uh, I don't think I knew any different. So I think we could – Milwaukee kind of – I'm sure just like a lot of the teams that, you know, rebuild, you know, we kind of the, – the guys, the youth, I guess, you know, that we all kind of came up throughout the system, so we – once we got to the big leagues, it wasn't like we weren't overwhelmed. We were, I mean, it's an, it's an overwhelming situation because of the fans, the TV, the everything is just magnified. But, you know, when you're there with, you know, of course, I was there. I was with, you know, Prince and Bronny and Ricky Weeks and JJ yep. and Gallardo and guys that you'd play with, Billy Hall. Like, you know, we'd all, Billy Hall was a year ahead of us. So, you know, you see guys that you feel like you're, oh, these are my friends, you know. So it's, it, it kind of, it, it takes down some of the, the stress level a little bit. You still want to do good, but you're like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. We've done it together our whole career, you know. So that made it really cool with Milwaukee. So we were always, you know, besides the the level of play, obviously, is higher. But we had our friends to hang out with and our friends to, to help us support us. So that that definitely made it an easier situation. And I said I never had to be the guy because I always had superstars on my team. So, like, I was always able to just kind of sit back and be that middle-of-the-road guy that had some success. But – you know, I didn't. I wasn't a guy that was leaned on, so I think that actually took some stress off me mm-hmm. and kind of helped my help my career. Well, yeah, we have another fan question here for you. What was they want to know? What was it like being part of two All Star games and obviously witnessing Josh Hamilton's home run uh, derby? But you, you said you mentioned that early. But what was it? They want to know what was it like being part of two All Star teams? They're fun. I mean, I think as a player, you're always trying to get not publicity, but you want to get recognized as a you know. Like, man, I'm having a good year. I'd love to get recognized. And I think that was the kind of moment. The first one was really cool because I was a, a fan vote. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I was having a good year. And, you know, I can't, you know, Clint, Hur- Clint Hurdle was the manager of the Rockies that year. You know, and I think he recognized that I was a 
you know, kind of an underdog country kid. It's a kind of, I'm sure so, I think similar to himself. So, you know, I was fortunate that he picked me in that, uh, that fan vote and Milwaukee fans went crazy. And I was up against, you know, like New York Mets, the Astros and another big market. So from Milwaukee to kind of step up and, you know, get me in was huge. And then the second time when I was uh, in Anaheim was, was really cool because I actually was in the, the Derby and just, oh. it's just cool to be, you know, these, if you're not in the if you're not in the game, you usually watch the game and kind of, you know, kind of wishing you were there. So just to kind of be there for those two moments was, it was really yeah. cool and really special. It was special for my kids. And you know, my kids are with me most of the time. So just being able to hang out with them and have that experience with them was cool. All right. Who, uh, when you, when, when you, when you were in the uh, all-star game, what, what was it like just uh, being with different, all uh, different players, different talented players from different teams and how different was that? What was that like for you just to be part of something special from uh, with different players and different teams? You're just, it's an, you're like in awe. Cause like I would, I'm a, you know, I'm a, obviously I was a baseball player, but at the same time I was a huge baseball fan, you know, so I'm like super fans of all these guys. So like, you know, being in the same room as Chipper Jones or, you know, facing like Maurer and uh, Rivera and things like that. You just, you're just, so it's kind of like a little starstruck if you will. Yeah. but it was funny, you know, but same thing. So I think, I think my starstruck kind of overwhelmed my, uh, my, my ability in those games, but it was such, there's such cool moments and, you know, things like that. Like, you know, I cherish those things because, you know, my boy was, he was little at the, the first one. He was like three or four. So he wasn't with me. He was in the stands with his mom. But, you know, my daughter was on the field with me in New York. And then the second year when we were in Anaheim, that was two, he was a little older. So he was on the field with me. So I had those, you know, pictures and just to kind of always good talking points with the kids just because they were there for that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, tell our fans and um, tell our fans, what was it, uh, what was it like being, Seeing Trevor Hoffman get his 600 save, uh, one of the, in my opinion, uh, one of the great closers to play, and also Mariano too. But what was it like seeing him get 600 saves and also being part of the Milwaukee Brewers uh, Wall of Honor? So Trevor was such a cool teammate, you know, because he came to Milwaukee towards you know towards the end of his career, you know. So his first year was lights out, and he actually made the All Star game his first year in Milwaukee, and he was ridiculous that year. You know, the second year wasn't as effective, but, you know, they battled through some stuff. And that was with kind of when the emergence of John Axford and, uh, yeah. you know, so that kind of, so Hoffman struggled a little bit and then Axford kind of took off. But to see uh, the Brewers still give him a chance to kind of to work through some of that stuff. And it was so cool when they when he got it because said, you know, they put him on his shoulders and they carried him off the field. And it's just one of those experiences like that, you know, you see some of these older coaches crying and you realize the importance of, you always want to win games, but the importance of just, you know, recognizing like really cool things when they happen because they don't always happen. So that was such a cool thing for me. What was the second question? Oh, uh, what was it like being part of the Milwaukee Brewers uh, wall of honor? Same thing. I mean, it's different, obviously different because it, it was life after baseball, but you know, I said, I was, I was said I was a, I was pretty average player but I had an above average work ethic and above average uh, mindset. So, you know, I, I got, I was a big guy, but you know, I was going to strike out I was going to make errors and I was going to do stupid stuff, but I, my game plans were always really good. So I was trying to give myself the best chance and, you know, to be recognized for, like, again, I said, I thought I was an average guy with uh, above average mm -hmm. game plans. So I think that for them to recognize me and to kind of acknowledge the fact that, you know, that stuff, you know, you don't always have to be that superstar to, you know, to make things happen and be important to a team. And, you know, I was, I loved every minute of it. And Milwaukee people are so, you know, gracious. And I think the the group, you know, kind of loves me for that. And I love the fact that, the, you know, I like going back and hanging out with those guys. And, you know, I'm still, when I go there, I'm still a player for somehow. I'm not, but they still treat me like I'm a, a somebody. So it's really cool. Hey, like I said earlier, I mean, you brought the intensity to the game. You're underrated. I love watching you play, and um, and every, I, I mean, even though you, even though you keep saying you're average, you, I, in my opinion, you you were uh, you were a great a good, good great player, and uh, and even though you struck out a lot, or you you kept you kept you helped the team win. Uh, so you you're the type of player that everybody wants on a team. You kept, you help the team win, and and like I said, you brought um intensity. So that that's that's what teams like like about players now. In my opinion, no, I definitely. I said I, I didn't expect 
the greatness all the time. You know, I, I was out there trying as hard as I could. Every, you know, I was like, I said, I feel like if I just worked hard and tried hard, you know, good things would happen. And, and that was the best part about, you know, playing, not being a DH, being, a, you know, playing the outfield or playing first base where, you know, I wasn't always going to be good in the batter's box, but, you know, I could try to make a good play to do something to help. And, you know, I was fortunate to be able to, you know, for that to happen a few times and be able to be decent, de decent enough defensively to, to save some of my bad games in the batter's box. <laughs> we have another fan question for you. One of our fans wants to know, what was it? What was it like playing in front of the fan base in Milwaukee? And obviously Milwaukee is known for beer, their beers and all, and the fan goes crazy. So what was it like being part of that fan base in Milwaukee? No, it was, it was awesome. So I think, you know, you don't, I guess as a player, like a younger player, you didn't, I didn't realize the importance of a, a good fan base. You know, you're just like, I want to be a part of a, a big league team because that's just kind of everybody's goal. But then yeah. you get there and you, you realize, oh crap, these, these fans are, they're dedicated. They they love their group, and it doesn't matter. Milwaukee is one of those few pla few places that it doesn't matter if you're the you know the best player on the team or the worst player on the team. If you're on the team, you're on the team, and they love you, and they they respect you, and they want you. They want nothing but the best for you. So it was really cool because whether I was hot and doing great or struggling, and you know, they still had your back, and they still were super supportive, and they cheered for you every time. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I once I left Milwaukee, I you know realized how good I had it there. Well, wow. yeah, so uh, I got to ask you this. So Tim Jailer showed on the show, he showed the his beer, his beers uh, the, that was named. Uh, he has two, a few beers that's named uh, that he has uh, on his own. But, well, I so I got to ask you this. What, what's your favorite beer? My favorite beer? I mean, I, I'm kind of basic. I love, like, I like Modelo and Corona. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm like a whiskey guy. I like whiskey and I like things like that, like Moonshine. Oh, nice! Oh, Moosh, <laughs> there. Moonshine. Okay, <laughs> and we got we got some we got some of the works. Oh, really? Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah. So, um, did you ever? So, I uh, obviously you uh, did everything to so tell our fans. Did everything to yourself. Maybe I could have spent your whole career with the Brewers. And obviously, uh, sports is a business. Players move around all the time. And how tough was it for you that you had to leave Milwaukee and but you you ended up with another great uh, team in Seattle? No, it was it was tough. I mean, like because I, I of course I would have loved to stay in Milwaukee my whole career, but after thirteen, I actually had the, both the big knee surgeries. I just wasn't like I knew I couldn't play every day. Like I couldn't have been. They wanted me to play first base, and which would have been fine, but I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it every day. So I needed, you know, a place where I could DH or have days off, and you know, American League was kind of I felt like the right choice because I felt like, you know, I have, I have a chance to be more productive. Of course, I wasn't really productive, but because I kept getting hurt. So that was kind of the thing. So I didn't want to leave. But at the same time, I said I felt like I would have handicapped Milwaukee if I would, you know, sign to come back and be their first baseman. And I might have played half the time. So I would have loved to stay there just because of the comfort level. And I was, you know, I had friends and family that were there. And it just said, like, it's all I knew. So I, it was very uncomfortable leaving there. But I feel like at the end of the day, like, you know, we had to try to make it last as long as we could. And that was obviously outside outside of Milwaukee. But see, see, Seattle, you know, it was a good team. You know, that, that was the first year they brought Robbie over. And, you know, we had I think we got beat the last day of the year to make the playoffs. But it was fun. It was, you know, it was different for sure. You know, I didn't have that. Definitely uh, the value of Milwaukee uh, stands alone for me. Yeah. <laughs> With the uh, uh, jokes, oh, this uh, so what did you say to yourself when you saw the Cano contract that the Mariners gave him? <laughs> well, no, I mean at the time, I mean he was one of the better players. So you just, I mean, of course, it was a big contract at the time. Of course, now it doesn't seem very big yeah. when you look at some of these contracts that are being handed oh. out. But, yeah. but as you know, as a, I feel like, of course, back then Robbie was one of the best players in the league, so it was kind of inevitable somebody was going to pay him. Yeah, I think that, but it, it brought a lot of attention to Seattle and. So that year they all, we almost won. So it, it would have been kind of cool to for that to happen. But of course, you know, they all they do a lot of good things over there. Did you uh what, what was it like being on the West Coast and um being it, obviously Seattle's cold too, but you, you're used to the weather weather, but what was it like just uh, tra uh transitioning to from the National League to the American League? Like you said, it helped you uh be a longevity your uh be a longer career, but what was it like the difference? What was the adjustments you had to make? Uh, I should say for the from the National League to American League. Well, just like I, I you know, I'd never actually DH before before I went over there. So, 
going over there and trying to DH, which is not always easy. I mean, like, you know, you're, I'm used to playing in the field and, you know, you're always involved in the game. And then all of a sudden you're DH and then you're, you know, you're, you have your one at bat and then it might be, you might hit next inning, you might hit three innings. And it's like, just to try to stay focused and stay moving around because you can get things can kind of tighten up on you. But that kind of, that was tough. And then like the National League, of course, now they have DH, but uh, I love the the chess match part of it. You know, where you had like double switching, you know, who you never knew if the hitter, pitcher was going to hit. So you're always ready when you're not playing. So it was very easy to like, if you're DH or not play, if you're not playing in the American League to just kind of like shut it down. So I like the, the hitting I just like the National League better. I like the fact that said I was always in, invested and in, involved because there's always that chance you're going to get in it, whether it was hitting or the field. And American League didn't, at that time didn't necessarily have it, but of course now it's all the same. So, but that was, I, I enjoyed Milwaukee. The H was challenging because I had a hard time like staying involved. Uh, we have another fan question for you. They want to know who are some of the toughest pitchers you had to face in your career. <clears throat> Well, it's always, you know, the, I think it kind of changed, like changed throughout my career. But like I was I always make, of course, I always get made fun of for this one. But like uh, there was a guy named Jeff Karstens, mm -hmm. which nobody's going to know the name. <laughs> but he was a guy in Pittsburgh. And uh, yeah, literally, I think I was two for 22 with probably 15 strikeouts off the guy. Yeah. And he probably, he probably touched 89, maybe. He was 88, 89, just kind of a, an average righty. And I couldn't hit the dude at all. And then. My last the bat off him, I hit a homer. And of course I'm all excited and like, I got him finally. <laughs> and I can around I round third and the trainers are already on the mound. And he blew his arm out when he threw the pitch. Oh my god. So I was like, oh crap. Oh. So I was all excited because I finally hit him, but I, I hit him for a reason. Because <laughs> he so he hung he hung a breaker ball on of course he because it hurt his arm. So that kind of that kind of defeated the defeated that. But those are kind of situations where you get those kind of guys gave me fits like Tom Glavin was really hard. Oh. You know, like early in my career, Cole Hamels was crazy hard. But then I, as I got, you know, I said some, but then eventually I, I was okay hitting him. And then like Zambrano was really hard for a little bit. And then, you know, you kind of make those adjustments and just kind of, I don't know, it kind of was like flip the coin. Some guys are really hard always. And some guys like I hated. And then eventually I kind of figured them out a little bit. But. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, speaking of Pittsburgh, you actually you ended your career with the Pittsburgh Pirates, and you were going back to the National League and uh, talk about that and uh, what what was that like going to going uh, going back to the National League but uh, playing for Pittsburgh Pirates? I mean, it was a good group. I mean, that was I was there with McCutcheon, got Garrett Cole, and AJ Burnett. Like, I, yeah. uh, Morton was there. We were good, man. We had a it was fun. Same thing, but it was a it was a role. I was a role player there. You know, I went there as a bench guy and. That was, it was, I knew that things were winding down. So that part was, you know, kind of just kind of waiting it out just to be, to keep kind of hanging on. But towards the end of that year, I got to a point where I was like, this is over. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> just because, you know, the fans were so different there. Like I was so used to Brewer fans were just always there and loud and like just encouraging and just so supportive. And then you have Mariner fans who were, yeah. you know, they were just kind of hit or miss, you know, if the, yeah. if, football or soccer wasn't there they would kind of come out but you know the the fan at that time they weren't necessarily there all the time and then pittsburgh you know you play you could play in front of twelve thousand people or fifteen thousand. i'm like where's everybody at you know because we were actually pretty good and then of course i think i don't know i don't know how they are now i don't really follow them but it was it was kind of fun but it said that was where my son was you know pretty heavy in the club ball already it's a 10 year old so i was kind of getting that like all right i want to go coach him and be involved in that i'm tired of and this kind of stuff and you know my daughter was a cheerleader i just wanted to be around and see what they were doing versus being away all the time yes i think you know, pittsburgh has young talent now and and mccutcheon actually he uh i think he just resigned with the pirates again this yeah. and, and uh, what a great career still going at it and man what a underrated player and for you when you were in pittsburgh what was it like playing with mccutcheon also garrett cole uh that's when he was starting to beginning uh to get going in his career and uh, when he went to Houston, he changed a lot, and then when he now he's with the Yankees and he's doing much, uh, he's established himself as an ace pitcher. But talk about what was it like seeing him uh, in Pittsburgh and also McCutcheon? Well, I mean, like when I was in Pittsburgh, McCutcheon was like an MB type player. You know, he was like 
so it was it was no different. I mean, because I you know I went from playing with Braun and Prince to mm -hmm. like Cano to McCutcheon, so I always had like that superstar to kind of watch. And it was no different. I mean, he's worked his butt off, and it was just really good. And it was fun to pay attention to all the time because you, you kind of never knew what to expect. But you know, like I said, it was just a good team. I and mean, you had Garrett Cole and AJ Burnett were at the top of the rotation. And it's like uh, Cole was kind of the young, the young gun that he was just really good, but you could still tell like if he you know, refined it a little bit, he was going to be who he ended up being. Like he was just really good and really focused. And but, I mean, we, like it was a good team. I mean, it was fun to pay attention to. That was a, you know, AJ or Mercer was our shortstop, and yeah. I think Walker was the second. You know, it was just I don't know. And then Harris, I think, was our third baseman. There was some. It was a high energy team. Young, you know, you had young guys that had kind of came through and were productive and you know, just fun. It was a fun kind of group to be around. We have another fan question here. One of our fans wants to know, outside of playing at Miller Park, what would you say your favorite park to, uh, was to play in in your career? <clears throat> uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh, so Milwaukee, just because I love it. You know, I like I like indoor <laughs> indoor baseball fields. And, you know, yeah, as a player, you ne never have to worry about weather. And, of course, the ball travels. So that's always nice to the hitter. But Pittsburgh, man, is so pretty. Like the the backdrop is amazing. Mm -hmm. So like I, even when I wasn't, even when I was in Milwaukee, like you know, people would always ask, like not just me, like you hear it all, from a lot of players, just it's hard to beat that like unique setting. They have like the yellow bridge and when the light. It's just really cool. Like the city is right behind the field, and it's just kind of a unique setting. So that's by far the prettiest stadium out there. Yeah. So it's um. Obviously, family is big in in sports, and obviously to players. So, how 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 important was it for you for your family to have your support from day one, and for you and to see you, to see you travel with the team every time when you guys go on road trips? So, talk about the family support, and also uh, when when we promoted this interview on Twitter and Instagram, a lot of people uh, had some great things to say about you, especially on Twitter. And but talk about the support you had throughout your career. No, I was, I mean, super supportive, man. Like, well, you know, I was pretty fortunate. I met my wife, in like, you know, early minor league. So she was there the whole time. And, you know, we had kids young. So, you know, if we went on the road ever, like if it was more than a two, like, you know, you have a lot of three city stops, I guess, 10, 11 day road trips. She would always, you know, make sure she went to one of them. So, you know, like, it's very easy when you have like kids, like to forget about, forget about baseball. You know, because you know, you're going to have some bad games. So to go, you know, from a bad game to go home and hang out with my kids made life so much easier. And, you know, the fact that I realized that it is just a game, it's fun, it's work, and you want to be as good as you can be. But to have, you know, my wife, my kids support was huge. But my you know, my parents were always there. You know, they, they anytime we were close to Kentucky, which is, you know, Cincinnati or Atlanta or even St. Louis sometimes, like, you know, they can make the drive up and, I was fortunate through the minor leagues, like we were in Huntsville and Nashville, which was, you know, less Nashville an hour from where I grew up and Huntsville was about two and a half hours. So in Louisville has a triple A field. So I was pretty close to, you know, places pretty regularly. So I had you know, a lot of fans coming through in the minor leagues. They kind of helped me kind of just, you know, realize how cool it is to be part of any kind of professional sport. So, you know, I enjoy that aspect, but my, you know, I always had my, co my old coaches would show up and, you know, this, you know, I always felt like, my support was always there. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll take one more fan question here. They want to know if do you like the new rule changes now in the game? Not really. I'm kind of old school. I like the, I like just to play the game the way it is. But I mean, I I didn't hate it as much as I thought I would. You know, I, I, after spring training, I'm like this is gonna be a nightmare. <laughs> but then it kind of everything kind of progressed. But you know, I like said I like I hated the fact like you know I play with guys that pitcher especially like doug davis mm -hmm. i mean he, he'd slow he'd slow the game down on purpose yeah you know but that's that's the way he worked and that made him really effective but like you know how's a guy like that work in today's game i mean like so that i feel like you know some players need that as part of their as part of how they how they that's how they get guys out or that's how they work in the batter's box and so i didn't like that changing part of it because it you know some guys work fast so it it doesn't affect them but it does affect others so I like, you know, I didn't hate it as much as I thought I would, but I still prefer, you know, the old school rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a couple more things here before I let you go. And um, after after your baseball career, you, you return. You also you you return to Bowling Green a few times, and 
um, you 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 uh, you have a couple of local charities. So tell our fans uh, what charities are you a part of uh, and Bowling Green when you return to Bowling Green. Well, so Bowling Green, well, of course, we don't get back there too often now because the uh, they have way too many animals and too many kids, so it's kind of hard to, to leave here. But you know, we're home, so my you know my the biggest thing that I want to I try to support when I'm home is uh, or even from here is like Bowling Green uh, East Little League. That's where I, I played Little League as a kid. So, you know, and actually, you know, me and my wife built them uh, like a big hitting, hitting facility because, you know, Kentucky gets cold weather and, you know, you can, baseball is not necessarily a year-round sport there. So we we built them, um, you know, a big hitting facility that, you know, people can use. And it's kind of, it, but it's so funny, after they, after we built it, they, they've been to like the Little League World Series like four times. Wow. Hmm. So they've been, that's kind of made them, you know, we were, they were always good. And I was, when I was there, we were good, but we were always just a little short. But it gives them a you know place to train every you know basically year round, and they've taken full advantage of it. And it's been really cool to see them make it. And I bet I was able to go up there the second or third time they made it, and it's really cool. To, of course, it's a cool place, but you know to see your hometown, you know some of the kids that you know look up to me. It was I was it was fun to go out there and watch them support them, and you know that's kind of the thing that we like to to pay attention to out there. Wow, that's awesome, and um, and I love to see when. Uh, like especially these kids compete in a high level and the little league worlds. They when they compete in the little league world series, it helps them gain the confidence to play in big games when they move up in their careers. And just, I love watching the little league world series because they're so talented and at a young age, and and they know how to. And the the coaches do the right thing by teaching them teaching them the right way to play baseball. Oh, for sure. And that's play. That's that's a, of course. It, even as players, that was always a one of the highlights of the season was when that came on. So guys that, you know, so you're always pulling for your state to try to, you know, make some cool bragging rights. And I was good. Happened after I, it happened after I was playing, but once I still, I still watch it now, but once, you know, when that team's there, they're, I, don't, I don't miss those games. Yeah. So tell our fans, what are your thoughts on this year's off season so far? Like you said, the crazy contracts coming out. Uh, Otani got a big deal. Yamamoto got a big deal from both from the Dodgers. Dodgers are spending Stupid money right now, uh, and then also the Yankees making moves with uh, Juan Soto and Alex Verdugo. But talk about this overall all season so far in baseball. I mean, it's been interesting. I mean, I feel like it's still been kind of quiet. Yeah. Like I mean, you have the big teams have made you know have, have made some moves, but you're still waiting for some of the smaller markets. Which in Milwaukee, that's why I loved the uh, when they pitched that ahead because Milwaukee was you know that, that small market that has to be very strategic who they get and. I thought they did such a good job over the last, you know, four or five years with moving, you know, getting the right players because they can't go get the, you know, those fancy names. So they've done such a good job of getting guys that work well in their system. And so I'm, I'm, I'm still looking for them to make a few moves just to kind of help them out and, you know, plug in a few holes. But I said, Milwaukee's not the, the big market that's going to spend a crazy money. So they, they go get the right player that fits them. And which you have a lot of teams like that, that, you know, Pittsburgh has to go get the right player, and same thing with a lot of those teams. So it'll be interesting. I mean, there's still some good names out there. So I definitely wouldn't hurt, uh, hate to hear a, a cool name go through and end up in a Brewer jersey. Do you like what the Dodgers? Do you think they need to change it up a little, or do you like the, what the Dodgers are doing? Like every year, they try and get, they always get the superstar, but they don't know how to finish it. But is how, do you like what they're doing every off season? I mean, I'm not. No, I mean not really. I'm, I'm I'm a guy that I'd rather, you know, like they have a really good, you know, I'm sure they have a really good minor league system and really good minor league players. So, you know, it, I was fortunate in Milwaukee, like wasn't a big spending team. So you had there was always that hope, like if I just keep playing good every every year, I'm going to go up a different level and have a chance to get to the big leagues. You know, if you're if you're in the Do Dodgers minor leagues, like you know that, that's not always the case. I mean, if they don't. They're going to spend money, so it doesn't matter if you're the best player at your position in AAA or AA. Like, you know, odds are they're going to you're not going to play for the Dodgers because they're going to spend money somewhere else. And you know, you still might. They do have young guys that come through, but it, it's very. Uh, I think as a young player, it would kind of it, I wouldn't want to be there just because of the fact that if I don't do well or the team did well, they're going to go spend money and get the next the best player they can and, and spend yeah. a crazy amount of money. So of course, I live in Arizona, so I was. I was pretty happy that Diamondbacks did what they did. So, but, yeah. You know. Yeah. Speaking well, of, like, huh? go ahead. Well, what, what happened? Oh, no, I was just saying, like, the I love the fact I like the teams that you let young guys kind of yeah. develop, develop because you never know what you're going to have. And sometimes, like, 
the, the big markets that you don't they don't you don't get to see what a guy has or the potential they have because yeah, you know, that, that their you know their opportunity doesn't come through, and you know you might get an opportunity, but as a young player, you, you might need a couple of those opportunities to you know to kind of settle in. So teams, you know, those middle markets and lower markets, and you, know, you see those young guys thrive more, thrive more in those situations. Yeah, and speaking of um, the Bur- uh speaking of the Brewers, uh, talk about uh, obviously Brandon Woodruff is still a free agent, and um, he he might have to miss the ne- this year because of the injury he had. But talk about uh, watching Corbin Burns every fifth day, man, he's uh, unbelievable to watch. And uh, there's talks of him being traded, but uh, talk, just talk about him in general as a pitcher. And uh, w- w- they need the and do you think they need to find a way to keep him? I mean, yeah. I mean, if you want to, to me, if you want to still be as competitive as they've been, like you need, you need those guys on the mound. Like you need, you know, Milwaukee is the last you know handful of years have been a pitching first team. So pitching defense is going to be, if that's the way you're going to get to the playoffs every year, you need, you need guys like Corbin and Peralta and Woodruff. And like, I mean, if I'm Milwaukee, I, I'm signing Woodruff to a two-year deal. Like mm-hmm. right now, like obviously no, no one this year is probably a wash, but you know, I, I guarantee he would take a two-year deal, you know, like, cause this year, give him a, maybe a million or two to, to rehab and be part of the team. And you might get him towards the end of the season, but, Knowing that he's gonna work his butt off and he's gonna come back and he he'll be that two three and twenty five right so like I think he's I would look I'm sure he wants to be, be a brewer I mean because he, he's done so you know his friends there success there so I would do that just to keep him and I think that would make everybody happy but I so said you need those pitchers like to have those guys that you know you, like when you would say when Corbin and Peralta and Burns are on the mound or Burns like Woodruff are on the mound like you expect to win those games and. As a hitter, it, it takes so much stress off knowing that you don't got to score four or five runs. Like if, if we put up a couple of runs, we, we have a chance to win this game. That's that's a big deal for an offense. Uh, one final thing before we let you go: uh, Did you get to go to the World Series games when it? When they the What's that? Did you get to go to the World Series games when they were playing in Arizona? No, well, I mean, no. <laughs> I'm a I'm I'm a I'm a Diamondback fan, but. I don't think I'm ever going to spend the money to go to a World Series game. I'm pretty cheap, unless unless it's a Brewer game. Like if the Brewers ever make it, we'll be there for sure. But if uh, anybody else, even teams like I like, I'm gonna, you know, drink a beer and watch them on TV. Well, so what was your thoughts of uh, seeing Texas Rangers winning the first World Series after 52 years? What, what was it, what was it like seeing that? That was cool, but it's, uh, I think it gives hope for uh, yeah. you know teams like Milwaukee, teams that have never done it. Like you know, Texas has been close. Milwaukee's been close a lot, so I think just for for them to take it, you know, the next step. But I mean, they did a really good job with this off that off season. You know, they brought Seager in. You know, Scherzer. They they were able to, to do some moves, and of course, the young guys stepped up big time. You had a lot of young guys that came through, which you you know you need for a team that's you know going to make it far. You have to have young guys to step up and kind of produce, and their young guys are really good. So I think that gives hope for other teams like that, like Milwaukee and smaller markets that can come through and, you know, have lean on their young guys and let their young guys thrive and, you know, give you a chance. And of course you got to pitch. So, yeah. So they, uh, so there you have it. Uh, Corey, uh, where can our fans find you on social media? And uh, would you like to say anything to the fans? No, just always thanks for support. You know, I, I, I played a long time and my, uh, my career was, Definitely enlightened by the fact that I had the Milwaukee fan base behind me at all times. But now I'm on social, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and you know I like to talk to people when I can. But I'm always, of course, my Facebook and all that stuff is all my kid stuff. So if you're interested in what we're doing now on the farms, like check me out. <laughs> yeah, so there you have it. Former MLB outfielder Corey Hart joining the show today. And Corey, I just want to say thank you for joining and thank you to our fans for tuning in and asking great questions also. Uh, so, but Corey, thank you again. Uh, we'll stay connected and uh, keep up the great work and uh, um, and happy new year to you and your family. And uh, thank you again for joining. No, oh, thanks. And I'll see you guys. And I'm sure I'll see you soon. I'll be in Milwaukee in a few weeks for the fan fest. So nice. come thanks. hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it.